Welcome back. Good afternoon. Uh, I hope you had a lovely virtual break, uh, perhaps got some coffee. Uh, and now we're moving on to another subject, another area of sustainability, which um, sustainability considerations, which has been getting a lot of attention in the past few years. And that is trying, basically trying to be uh, less wasteful as societies and as businesses. Uh, it is about encouraging circular economy, about reusing resources, not just using them and discarding them. Uh, and to discuss this and share their experiences in, the, in this area, um, I have with me four panelists. Ma Mark Shaler, who is the founder of APE, which is a consultancy. Vanessa Wright, who is the Group Vice President for Sustainability and Responsibility at Bernard Ricard. Andreas Arn Arns, who is the Head of Climate at Inter IKEA Group. And uh, Eric Lindroth, who is the Sustainability Director at Tetra Pak Europe and Central Asia. Um, Mark, I would like to start with you. Uh, perhaps you can sort of give <coughs> us a, a broad, you know, 30,000 foot view of, of what the circular economy is and what sort of business model transformation uh, would be required in order to actually go from where we are today to that um, you know, uh, utopian world of, of zero waste. The big gold dream. Um, so circular economy is a response to a linear economy, the, the traditional take, make, use and dispose economy where we, where we take resources, turn them into product, turn them into value, um, generate a, a, a growth in value financially and then make the customer happy or, or, or you know, solve a problem. Um, but that's linear. The ending result is that the product will move potentially into landfill um, or other or other non-reusable forms. And the circular economy is saying, hang on a minute, what if we uh, began to increase the um, recovery and the return of some of these resources? What if things lasted a little bit longer, so you increased the time that the product is circling or the materials that are circling? Or what if you built in um, secondary or tertiary uses of those raw materials so you can just keep things going as, as polymers or as raw materials longer. So it's about, it's about reducing the leaks out of a system. And that can be, um, a, of, I guess, biological system. So we are whatever, 60 harvests from soil collapse, a little less now, probably 55. Uh, and that's because we're pulling the nitrogen and other resources out of the soil putting them into plants, washing them into the ocean, a whole range of leaks happen. So closing that loop is super important. Um, but most people would think about it in terms of the, the, the raw materials, the polymers, the, the metals, uh, the, the raw materials that we make product out of, getting that back at the end of its life and then recovering and, re and reprocessing that into new products. So our raw materials are made from our wastes. So to just let me, let me just can... jump in just for, for just for a moment because this is this obviously poses a, a big question for the producers of the raw materials like if they're leaking out somewhere that means that you actually need the, the, the people <clears throat> who transform them into into value need less of it um, yeah. uh, and therefore th those who are pur purveying those materials might be worse off uh, and for so sure. on up the chain. So, um, so how do you, you know, is, is, is the circular economy basically, does that mean sort of mass unemployment across vast industries which provide things like primary plastics? Or, or bauxite or other ores. Um, <clears throat> I think mass unemployment is unlikely, but there will be an impact. You know, if you're, if you're recovering every single bit of aluminium that you're processing, that you're using in the first place, and aluminium is a beautiful example because it can go on and on and on and on, then you're going to need more less dug out of the ground. And therefore, you're going to need less people digging it out of the ground now. But you will always lose a little bit. And so you will elongate the supply. You will make the supply more secure. And there's a whole there's a whole massive issue of geopolitics that actually sit behind this that we've not even begun to discuss yet. And 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 that's a great question. And it's beginning to nudge that needle more than the unemployment needle. Who controls the means of production? That's a massive, massive issue. And that that speaks of kind of countrywide and global power systems. 
We might come back to that, but I would like to sort of maybe dive into some specifics. Vanessa, can I start with you? So, uh, you know, a lot of companies these days, you know, issue sustainability reports um, and uh, and they, they strive towards various, um, you know, degrees of, of sustainability measured in various ways. What does circularity mean for Pernod Ricard? So circularity means, uh, I mean, exactly what Mark said, you know, rather than looking at a linear model to look at, look at a circular model and to think about that in every aspect of our business, I would say, from, from grain to glass. So that, that starts with our agricultural raw materials. So when we're producing our products, for example, at the Absolute uh, Distillery, which is, by the way, 60% 60, 60 more efficient than, than the average distillery and really adopts a circular mindset. For them, it's about every step of that production of that distillation process um, to make sure that everything is reused as much as possible. So, for example, the CO2 that's recovered from fermentation is then used by other industries to grow vegetables or algae or other things like that. Um, the byproduct from the distillation process is used to feed more than 250 thousand pigs and cows a day. So that's just one example. So there's a, a part in the agricultural uh, side and, and the distillation side. There's also, of course, um, within the packaging side. And for us, that's hugely important. And actually, it's really about a shift in mindset. It's really about making sure that there's a very strong link between the marketing and the operations side of our business. So when our marketeers are creating products and having these fantastic visions of these amazing products, that they're actually thinking about what going to happen to them at their end of the of end of life and that's really a key part of our 2030 strategy which is to make sure that by 2025 all of our packaging is recyclable compostable uh, or, or reusable um, so th that's very much in the mindset so it's as i said from the creation to the making and also to the end of the life you know um, working as much as we can with in different countries we're present in over more than 80 countries to see how we can help improve re recycling rates in all the countries where we operate and in some countries ourselves uh, we're taking back our bottles like in India where we take back 10% of our bottles and we clean them and reuse them again so for us it's in every part of the life cycle of our business. So Vanessa I'd like to follow up on that um, because what you're describing does seem to me like basically being a well-managed business in in the sense of just basically trying to eliminate all waste um, clearly, if, if that's the case, it's uh, something that all businesses should be doing all the time. Um, so there's presum the reason they haven't done it in the past is presumably that there is some cost to doing this. So how do you decide where to invest uh, in making your business more circular uh, as opposed to where to you know, retain parts of the linear model? How do you go about making those decisions? Because again, sort of, you know, efficiency gains are um, are, are something that all businesses strive strive for. But sometimes they come, you know, they need they require an early investment. So how do you justify those investments internally? How do you decide which ones to to follow up on? Yes, yeah, so I think, of course, uh, you're absolutely right. That means that we've got to look at all parts of the business. But I think through our uh, 2030 strategy, we've made some very clear decisions about where we're going to be um, investing to make sure that we're supporting that business to be a more circular business for the future. So, for example, there's been a huge um, amount of work and a huge um, uh, support behind all our operations and, uh, and value engineering to look at all of our uh, products and see how we can really uh, strengthen what we're doing and strengthen all the circularity around them. We're also, of course, looking at things like uh, weight reduction. And when you reduce, of course, the weight of a, of, of a bottle, um, then, of course, you're reducing the, the, uh, the transport costs as well. So whilst there's, there's cost involved in the first instance in terms of the equipment you might need to put in place, actually, you get the payback at the other end of the, end of the scale as well. Does that mean, for instance, using more plastic rather than glass? Glass is heavier well, actually, than, than plastic. It, it in, in our business, um, we're actually 99% uh, actually recyclable already. Uh, we're only 1% uh, plastic and other materials. So it, potentially we might look at that for the future, but for now um, our glass uh, products 
um, will will remain. We're happy with the with the packaging that they're in, um, but we're looking at ways to reduce, as I said, the recycle, increase the recycle content and reduce the weight. All right, um, Andreas, I would like to um, ask you about IKEA's uh, target of becoming or striving to become fully circular by 2030. Could you tell me what specifically that means? I mean, does that mean you won't be using any primary materials? I mean, I, I just sort of would love to understand. I would love for you to unpack a little bit what that target encompasses. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And I think first, I mean, we need to start by, I mean, we are a home furnishing company and we have been a linear economy now for the last 76 years. So we are really in, until 2030, trying to convert the whole uh, business model into a circular one. And you can see from three different angles. Um, one of them, as you're on to, is what are the materials we're using. And therefore, one of the aims that we're going for at 2030 is to only use renewable or recycled materials. So for that, I mean, you can say primary material, if it's renewable, yes, but not if it's fossil. We're also trying to push as much recycled content as possible. But in addition to that, it's also how we rethink our offer to the customers. So we need to find solutions for them to acquire, care for, and pass on products. So we can really prolong the life of our products. And that also is connected to the third movement we need to do, and it's how we design our products. So that they already from the start, when we're sitting and drawing, are designed to be repurposed, repaired, reused, resold, and in the end, recycled. But that should be like the last resort. So it's really like a complete retake from how, how we meet the customers, how we design our products, but also the supply chain that we utilize as well. So, so I've got a couple of follow-up questions. The first is, how far along that target are you? So how far from full, what you would consider full circular, circularity is IKEA today in 2020? Well, first of all, when it comes to transforming our offer and the supply chain capabilities, we're now at the stage where we are using more, uh, or we're trying to look into different cases for different types of products. And what is the business model, which is most suitable for that product range? I mean, one circular business model may be suitable for appliances to maybe remanufacture them, repurpose, uh, like fridge, for instance, and upgrade it. But maybe you, you don't want to upgrade your toilet brush. Maybe you already directly want to make sure that it's recycled, uh, recyclable and made a recycled content. So we are in a stage where we're doing these pilots and also to understand what are the capabilities we need to have both in our range development, in our supply chain, but also how we should face customers uh, on the different services. So we're doing pilots, but we are right now having done those pilots to be able to scale it up as well. As well and you say, when... If you say full circularity, that sort of feels like 100% circularity. So how, how circular are you now? 50% circular, 70% circular, 20% circular? Well, I mean, that's a bit tricky to say, right? So what we've done, uh, first of all, when it comes to materials, 60% uh, of our materials today are renewable and 10% are recycled. So from that perspective, you can get 70% uh, recycled or renewable when it comes to materials. And what we did as a huge movement uh, last year, because we really had to revisit and look into what are the capabilities we need to drive. So we actually spent the whole last year just doing assessments of our range together with the product development teams to assess how circular are they today and how should we change the products to enable uh, circularity. But still, that's the business confidentiality, I think. But we're on our way, but we need to take one hour step. So, and the other question I had was sort of alluding to something that Mark said earlier, um, and that is, you said you want products to last longer. Again, if you want products to last longer, that presumably means that people will be buying fewer of them. Does that mean that each individual product, in order to get the same margins, is going to be more expensive, um, or or will you keep the price low but sort of sacrifice your returns? Uh, you know, you have there's this famous. Uh, 
tale of the Phoebus cartel and light bulbs in the in the 1920s, I think it was. Mark will probably know this better than me. But basically, a bunch of uh, light bulb manufacturers got together and said, no light bulb will last more than 3,000 hours or whatever it was. Um, and and that's how they started building. They could, in principle, last longer. There is a light bulb in, in California, which has been uh, on, uh, you know, uh, I think continuously for something like 100 years. Uh, so you could build a longer lasting product. People aren't because it makes sense to keep selling things to people. Um, so how do you how do you think about that as a as a business challenge? Oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. I, was, I, was, I, was, I want to go back to Andrea. Yeah. Okay, maybe you can continue after me, Mark. Uh, maybe we are a business, so of course we want to grow our business. I think that's the key, but it can't be on the expense of the planet. So, I mean, this is the challenge that we're in. How are we circle but still finding the growth? And I think as IKEA, we are here for the many people, for people with uh, thin wallets. As you said. So it should be affordable. It shouldn't be a luxury for a few. And what we've seen when we've done pilots is that if we can find the right capabilities to retain the value by prolonging the life of product, we can actually earn more. Take a sofa, for instance. If we only have a linear model, we can sell the sofa and we're out. I mean, we won't earn any more money on that sofa. But if we sell a sofa, but in addition, we might sell new sofa covers, no new filling as well, uh, repair kits, etc we can actually earn by prolonging the life of the materials and the products. Maybe not it's, it's maybe not maybe the whole product that will uh, last, but parts of it can be replaced, but the majority of the material in the product will continue to live. And this is the trick I think we're all facing, but we need to find the building. And we are fully committed uh, to I'll, it. I'll get back to Mark, uh, Mark to, to you in a second, but I would like to hear from Eric. Um, and you know, Tetra Pak obviously makes packaging. Packaging gets a lot of flack, um, uh, mm. especially plastic packaging, and um, and packaging that is difficult to recycle. So, uh, how do you look at this, and what does circularity mean for you as a business? Uh, yeah, it's it's a really really important question and one of definitions. Um, what we try to do, and similar to to IKEA, is, is to try try to take up a full life cycle perspective on, on the circular economy. I think that is what is frequently getting lost is, is that you end up in discussing end of life collection and recycling, which is sort of simple to explain because it, it touches all of us as, as individuals. We, we have to recycle our packaging, uh, but actually the, the, it is even more important to, to go with the start of life decisions and also during life. So, so for us, the circular economy is about three important questions that we need to answer today and tomorrow. And that is, what are the raw materials we're using? What is the impact during the life cycle? And what happens to the end, meaning when the, the, the packaging is empty? And we need to have good answers to all of these today and, and, and in the future, because this is about our competitiveness and our customers' competitiveness. If we have weak answers or problems in one or more of those questions, I mean, sustainability becomes a risk to manage and, and, and rather than an opportunity. Uh, so, so it's really, it's really about the core competitiveness of the company, uh, and, and to take this wider perspective of the circular economy. I mean, more along the lines of the life cycle. Is this something that you can do yourself as a company within your supply chain, or is this something that the entire industry would have to do in order to make it work? I mean, you are you making yourself uncompetitive by, you know, by investing more, uh, and therefore crimping your your profitability by, you know spending more on, on certain circular solutions on on looking at right. that you know start of life part of the uh, as opposed to just relying on, on on the end of life which is sort of beyond your remit in a way right it's mm. waste management mm -hmm. waste management is a municipal issue uh, and and mm. for some people sort of a personal issue right it's, a, it, it's an issue mm. of sort of personal responsibility so you're taking on that responsibility partly but if if the system isn't in place in order to actually um, take advantage uh, and and you know, leverage what what it is that you're doing. Does it actually make sense to do any of it, or is it just burdening you with a with an um, unnecessary cost, which makes you less competitive than than people who are less you know high minded? Right. 
No, no, but for me, this is a fundamental, yeah, competitive creation or value creation question. And it's like any investment. I mean, you have to put money up front for any investment to be able to reap the, reap the profits uh, later on. And, and for us, we have to take this from a value creation perspective from our customers' view. So the food industry, how do the decisions that we take impact the food industry and how can that make them more competitive? So let me take an example. We've, um, we are very much focusing on the movement away from the fossil economy, so fossil plastics towards renewable plant-based plastics. And in the, in the past five years in, in Europe, we've moved more than 30,000 tons of fossil plastic into plant-based solutions uh, based on, on bioethanol from sugarcane instead of oil, which is one way of, of showing that it has actual impact. In my home country, in, in, in Sweden, more than 80% of the plastics caps that we sell are from plant-based origin. And we have customers like um, Finland's largest dairy, Valio, who two years ago switched all of their packaging to fully renewable plant-based solutions from, from us. So, so, and that is when they can talk about that decision in, in positive terms, that's when value is created. So, so for us, uh, I think it's about being relevant and, and, and also leading the way. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, of course it's a cost, but, but anything is, is a cost initially, uh, but you have to capture the value later on. But, but are, you foreseeing, um, are you foreseeing, for instance, some regulations which are coming in that you will be readier for than people who invest less? Or is this just something that you think you know, it's just a consumer pressure or, or something else that is going to force everyone to, to go in this direction? I think it's, uh, I mean, right now the focus in the circular economy discussion is, is on end of life. But, but, but for us, uh, I mean, the simple conclusion is that you can't recycle your way out of the climate crisis. It's simply not possible. Uh, so you have to go right from the start. So, so for us, I mean, it's, it, it's about being competitive all along the value chain. Uh, to reach that net zero target that we have for the whole value chain, the scope three perspective. And, and then you, need, you, you cannot leave any stone unturned. So, so you really have to break it down and do all the improvements that you can, all the way from the renewable materials to the type of energy use, uh, how you minimize waste for our production, our customers' production, logistics, transport, uh, and, and finally also collection and recycling. So, so it has to, I mean, hang together as, as one chain. Uh, what what we can, it, are in control of, and that is our value chain. Um, Andreas, you wanted to, to chip in. I think I, I saw you waving your your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Eric says as well. And what also when we talk about investments to make the circular economy happen, I think it's critical to state that I mean no business development will ever happen without investments. I mean, if you think about if you have a grocery store, I mean automatic checkout stuff you have now. That is an investment to simplify buying for you. But it's also more critical that circular is also a mindset as well. And it could be that we already don't need to invest, but we have the capabilities internally in our company or in our supply chain. We just haven't realized it. And going back to Frost with the sofa case, the suppliers which produce the sofas, for us, they have the capability to refurbish the sofas. They just haven't thought about it previously as well. So I think we shouldn't be scared that everything is about investment, but we need to use our creative minds. It's a mindset and it's a huge potential here for business development as well. But if it's, if it's a systemic no, but, uh, problem, so actually, Vanessa, I wanted to come back to you on this as well, because um, if it's a systemic issue, you know, you, if you want to if you want to fix the problem, as, as Eric rightly says, you can't just focus on the end of life. Um, you have to focus on the entire value chain, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and how you know can is it possible for a single entity, for, you know even a large one like IKEA or Pernod Ricard or Tetra Pak, to to organize all this, or does it need an organizing principle from the top down in the form of some regulation that would incentivize all players along that you know complex supply chain? To tie that supply chain back into a neat little bow, as opposed to being a you know a long a long string, is is that it, it, Vanessa? So would you would you like? Is there sort of some form of regulation that you would like to see that you would see as motivating uh, Pernod Ricard to do something you know more quickly, for instance? 
I think at the moment it's true to say that um, we all have similar challenges and we, all, we, you know, we don't have the solutions. We're all learning as, uh, as we go along, quite honestly. Um, you know, a lot of this area is, uh, is a little immature, so we are all learning. And we're certainly taking, um, I suppose, advantage and to learn from others, which is why we're part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and CE100. That's why we're working with all of our suppliers, actually. We've We've gathered them all together um, quite recently to discuss with them how we can improve and change the things we're doing around paper, around glass, around all the components of, of our packaging. So I think we know we can't uh, solve that alone. So I think uh, as, as things progress, I think, yes, it probably would be helpful to see some um, some more frameworks that can really guide us and give us all uh, kind of go get us all going in the same direction. Um, but for now, I, I'd say what we're doing is we're really, uh, you know, trying to learn and work with our suppliers and, and partners. And as a result of that, some of the things we've done, for example, again, on Absolute is we've just recently announced, you know, a new innovative uh, paper paper bottle that we're testing and piloting uh, with consumers right now, and another example with Perrier Jouet, uh, where we've you know also uh, created a new type of packaging, more plant based packaging. So we're, we're we're you know we're trying to find those solutions. But I I to answer your question, I think you know as we progress, yes, there probably would it would be helpful to have some kind of framework that would help to guide everyone. So, Eric, I think you wanted to add something. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, it's an interesting perspective you, you give, Vanessa, that, that you need to interact with other stakeholders. I mean, legislators, of course. But what I find is, is particularly interesting is also when you start to interact with those who don't necessarily agree with you. So you're, you're maybe you're someone, your you're heaviest critics, uh, but by fostering that, that discussion and an open and honest uh, give and take, I think we can learn, we've learned a lot uh, over the years in, in, in doing that. And opening up for, for criticism may be difficult in the short term, but actually make you stronger for the long term. And, and that goes across mm -hmm. all stakeholders, I think. So, 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 so who, who disagree with the discussion? I think we've got to be prepared to make mistakes. So, so I, I do want to hear who disagreed vehemently with Tetra Pak. No, but I think uh, if you look at. Uh, uh, the extended producer responsibility as it started, that was a, a fundamental disagreement with the packaging industry as, as, as the operating business model. And I think yeah. many in the industry saw it as, as a huge threat. Uh, but today, I think we and, and also our customers see it as it's not a threat. I mean, it's just the way that it needs to work. You need to keep those resources in circulation. You need to get them back. A used package is not waste. It's a valuable raw material for, for, for new products. But, but that is, is, is a mindset change that takes time because any, I mean, we were talking about it before a little bit, but any change is uncomfortable because you need to do something different than what you're doing today. And that's always uncomfortable until you've decided why you need to do it and what you need to do. And once that is in place, you can start to work with it uh, with, um, uh, from a more real perspective. So I think that many, many critics uh, in, in the long term, and, and, and oh, sorry, in the short term, but in the long term, either you embrace it and, and make it part of your change uh, and your story, um, or it will be difficult, I think. So, Mark, I did want to come back at, to, to you at this point because uh, Eric <laughs> mentioned business models, and, and I did want to, to pick your brain on, on the sort of business models. Andreas mentioned some possibilities, but sort of, you know, how do you see business models changing? Um, as a result of, of larger swathes of the economy embracing greater circularity? Great question, and, and it will depend on the sector. But the E part of the circular economy, the economy bit, is as important as the circular bit. We can't break an economy and but by making stuff that lasts forever. So that we have to shift our business model. We just have to. And the examples that I've, the, the projects I've worked on are really, really straightforward. And, and don't forget, if you make something that lasts a long time, that doesn't mean it's the end of your income stream. So the car manufacturers make 60% of their profits from servicing vehicles, not from selling them, but from them, from keeping them going. OK, so how we make more money by selling less stuff is the key. And the workshop that the work that I've done, firstly, uh, with a jeans manufacturer. So uh, a really expensive clothing between 160 and 250 euros or dollars a pair. These are these are guaranteed to last for life. They will be repaired and refurbished 
if they break down. If they don't last me 10 years, I'll be really, really upset. But I'm, I'm middle class and I can afford that. That's a luxury to be able to afford that. The margins are super high on these things. If you've got no money, you can't afford $250 on a pair of jeans. So you buy a cheap pair. If you've got no money, you buy them from something called a catalog or a, or a club book, or will you buy them by, by ticking the box that says pay weekly? And you can spell weekly in two ways, right? And, and the interest on that is about 39%. So a very cheap pair of, say, 501s bought that way, over four years interest-free interest interest will cost you the same price as a pair of jeans that are guaranteed for life. And they will have worn out by the time you finish paying for them. So the business model opens up. It democratizes the ownership of great products. We can change access and democratic access to beautiful things and well-made things by changing our business model. This means that businesses will become finance houses or have to have relationships with finance houses. So, so cheap is more expensive and expensive is, is better value in that sense. Then in other areas we've, I've worked in, refill. So I'm um, going to Vanessa's area, refill system. Mm. Why are we shipping plastic or glass around the world at all? Let's send the liquid round in big, in big one kilo, one um, ton containers, one meter cube containers. And then let's have some, we did it with retail tainment in superstores. You get your bottle, it's got a liter of liquid in, off it goes. I drink my liquid, I bring the bottle back. It gets refurbished and cleaned in store. A new bottle or, or a refurbished bottle is then refilled and given to me again. So I'm removing packaging altogether and I'm creating this really lovely circular economy. And then the other work that we've done is on, um, washing machines moving from selling washing machines which a thousand pound washing machine is a big investment to leasing washing machines <clears throat> and by leasing washing machines you pay a certain amount per month the the manufacturer made 1.5 times more profit than on selling them because there's no retailer in the way it's a direct to consumer sale most importantly I, I then sign up to a washing a washing liquid service that gets posted to my door from my washing machine manufacturer so i have a, an ongoing service relationship there are many many more points that the manufacturer can make profit and that i can be made happier and so shifting the business model means that we elongate the relationship i would happily pay ikea 200 pounds a month for all my furnishing needs as long as they redesigned the spindle that holds the corner of wardrobes together so that when I drag them across the floor, they don't crack <laughs> because that's the single biggest challenge that I, I see. It's, 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 it's actually, you know, we can solve all of the material and product design challenges. It's the business model challenges that will slow this down and understanding the consumer and what they want out of it. That's the challenge. I think um, IKEA are going to respond to that. Yeah, I, I saw Andreas nodding, so you can expect some, you know, improvements in that in that uh, joinery. Um, I suspect soon. Uh, but uh, I did want to follow up on that because, you know, from the perspective of the of the seller of the final product, that makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, you've got even the big tech giants are moving towards subscription models, right? Um, mm -hmm. th that seems to be the sort of the, the recurring revenue streams seem to be the the future of uh, of technology as well as as being the future of um, of, of other industries, but it does mean that you know, for instance, that again, so coming back to my first question, that the providers of the raw materials or the intermediate goods do face a problem, of poss yeah. possibly a sort of semi-existential problem, because if you are cre creating that long-lasting product, the bits that go into it, you just need fewer of them, right? Do, do you is there is is there pushback from from the the you know the parts of the supply chain lower down and not directly um interacting with consumers against these moves are you seeing that in, yeah. um, among your I, clients I, I, I have once actually <clears throat> in, in many ways the raw material producer um, I've never had any problems there because they see an opportunity to reprocess that they know metallurgy or they know what they're doing better than anybody else and they can see a way of growing their business not like it is now but, they, but you've got to be brave, right? You, you can't stand there selling horseshoes to a world that wants tires. Like everyone knows that that's, and you can't stand there selling tires to a world that wants shoes because we just walk everywhere, right? So the, the, the bit that I've seen the challenge in is the cheap manufacturing um, houses in emerging nations 
who, who's and, and, and I completely understand that there is a, a shed load of jobs embedded in Bangladesh in making garments that are perceived as fast fashion. So that requires a different business model. And the way that some of the big fast fashion giants are doing things, so they're using polyester, they're closing the loop on the polymer, they're reprocessing it, they're remaking fabric, and then they're remanufacturing it into a dip. So my t-shirt becomes, um, yeah, and it becomes your underpants. Your underpants becomes Eric's scarf. And, and, and it goes on and on, and it would still need to be made by somebody. So depending on the sector, it depends on the size of the circle that you need to develop. You may need to still have fast fashion or fast product development, and in which case the impacts will be less. But let's not be naive. This is a revolution. This is, a, this is an industrial revolution, literally and figuratively, and there will be job losses and there will be job gains in other areas. So, Vanessa, I wanted to ask you, um, and, and, and uh, Eric and Andreas as well, but let's start with Vanessa. Have you uh, faced any form of sort of scepticism from, uh, you know, suppliers lower down the chain who do not interact directly with consumers against uh, your, your efforts to become more circular? Um, not so far. As I said, you know, we've, we've met with most of our uh, direct suppliers, but it's true not all the, the ones further down the chain. Um, of course, I think there, there will be questions raised, undoubtedly. And if it means that there's going to be less business, of course, there will be, there will be considerable pushback. But I think we all recognise that things have to change. I mean, one of our targets in our strategy is around exactly what Mark was talking about, which was, you know, do all our products need to be in single glass bottles? Um, of course, there are massive challenges being a consumable and being alcohol, but, you know, can we think differently about how uh, we're consuming our products. So those are the sorts of things uh, that we're looking at. Also around uh, the outer packaging, you know, traditionally a lot of uh, high-end whiskies have, have uh, paper cartons around them. Well, actually, do they need to? Because if you're giving them to bars and restaurants as opposed to supermarkets, they don't need to have that kind of outer packaging. And actually, more than anything, for those uh, those outlets, it's actually an irritation because they not only have to take it off, they've got to think about how that's disposed of and where it goes and probably costs them more money to do it. And by the way, it's the same with things like point of sale material, which again, we've made a commitment to no single use uh, plastic in any of our point of sale material, which was a deadline we have for 2025. And we've actually brought that forward to 2021. Again, because if you're in a, in a bar or restaurant environment, actually, do you want all this stuff anymore? Do consumers actually want any of this stuff anymore? And I would just kind of end that that at that point on saying, I think one of the key points is back to the consumer. And really, you know, we're a consumer centric business. So it's really understanding what is it that our consumers want? And are they actually, you know, are consumers prepared to do what they say they're going to do? Because everybody talks about, you know, yes, I'll buy more sustainable uh, products and I'm prepared to pay more, but actually are people when it comes down to it. So, you know, how can we help be part of that process to you use the power of our brands actually to explain and, and help strengthen uh, knowledge and understanding around circularity? Eric, I would like to ask you, if there was one policy that you would like to see implemented that would encourage a specific policy that would encourage greater, you know, circularity, for instance, uh, at, the, at the start of life. Is, is there some, is there a specific policy, uh, a specific regulation, a specific incentive that I think would encourage people to, to take this more seriously? I mean, I, what, one thing, one example that always comes to my mind is, for instance, if, if you exempted recycled pl plastic from v VAT, um, in a sense, it's already paid VAT, right? Be on the, the first time it went around the circle. So if you exempted uh, recycled plastic from VAT, that might be a monetary incentive to use more of it uh, rather than use the, the, the cheaper stuff, uh, often cheaper stuff, mm. depending on the oil price. Now oil price is very low, so, so primary plastics are very cheap. Um, so uh, is, there, is there a similar policy tool that you think would encourage greater circularity at the start of life? Uh, the simple answer to that is yes. And I think the, the simple answer is that uh, at least you should equate renewable and recycled content. Both are circular, but from different perspectives. But they are both good material choices. You avoid the, the fossil uh, virgin material. And I think what, what we see further down the value chain as well is a lot of customers right now uh, is, is creating business for us because 
when they switch to, to our packages uh, or solutions, they actually reduce the plastic use by 70, 80 percent uh, just by switching to a cotton based solution. Although you do have some plastic there, but then we have a, a task for us to reduce even further the plastic, uh, removing layers, finding different barriers, uh, not based on polymers, removing the aluminium so that, I mean, the goal we have is if, if not 100 percent, at least 95 percent of a package should be able to come from paper. And then that is very simple to recycle in the paper stream. So, yeah, challenges and, and opportunities in there as well. But at least equate the renewable and the recycled plastic content. I think yeah, that would be a good uh, starting point for me. So, Andreas, the final word goes to you. Um, do you see anything that could be done in the short term in order to encourage or maybe even bring forward that um, that goal of IKEA is to be fully circular by 2030. What could happen to make it happen in, say, 2025? Wow, that's a big question. Um, but I think well, you have you have 30 seconds. I think the, the thing is that the, the change will not come all at once, right? So I mean, now that we have done the pilots and the business cases, both within our supply chain and the service of the customers. I think what we need to do right now is the things that we have identified that we can deploy quickly, let's just do that. And we also know a few material areas which we can also speed up as well. So any change we can drive directly, let's do it. And then we know some things will take longer as well. Well, thank you, everyone. That was an optimistic note to end on. Um, I think it's clear that there is a lot of opportunity in, in becoming a more circular business. It doesn't necessarily need to, uh, to lead not just to mass unemployment, but even to decrease profitability, as we've heard today. Um, so uh, the best thing to do is for each and every business to look at where it can, um, where it finds its sort of lowest hanging fruit, uh, pluck those first, and then go from there. Um, and there's a lot of fruit about. So thank you very much to all um, uh, my panelists. It was a very interesting and, and productive discussion, and I'm sure it can continue and, and certainly should continue. Thank you all. Uh, before we break, I would like to invite you all to return for uh, Andrew Palmer's interview with the uh, Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, after a short virtual break. Thanks a lot.